Well, good evening. Good evening, Facebook. It is uh, 7.59. We go live at 8 o'clock, and so I'm just getting started, uh, waiting on uh, many of you to log in and jump on and uh, get involved with us tonight as we continue our Wednesday night studies. So for those of you that are already on, that you've jumped in already, you're going to need to grab your Bible and turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, it's 8 o'clock on Wednesday night, uh, and we are once again finding ourselves um, doing Wednesday night Bible study uh, via the internet. We're grateful for technology. We're thankful uh, for the opportunity to, um, to uh, use these great things. I was reading uh, something uh, today about technology and the Bible and how the uh, the kingdom of God is spread through technology, and and uh, one author wrote. He said, you know, even when Paul was pastoring churches from a distance uh, throughout the New Testament, he was using the technology of the day, the papyrus and a pen, and uh, the roads that Rome had built that were new to society. That he was using the technology in front of him, um, and so uh, we're we're uh, we're excited about the opportunity to. Uh, to continue to use technology and study the Bible together. And so uh, before we dive in, let me just uh, tell you a couple things. Let me give you a couple of announcements for those of you that are that are jumping in with us. Um, we are, for the foreseeable future, not having any activities on the campus at Elkdale. We're trying to be uh, safe. We're trying to be good citizens. Uh, we're trying to love our neighbor. I saw a very promising article today where because of social distancing, uh, the numbers projected for Alabama have gone down uh, than what they first projected that would be contracting the virus and or falling ill to the virus. So that's a good thing. It means it's working. Uh, and so that's, um, that's a blessing. Uh, and so for this week, because we can't gather together, and it is Easter week, we're going to have a Good Friday service uh, online right here. Um, uh, Friday night at 8 o'clock. Some of you have asked why are we doing Wednesday night at 8 and, and Friday night at 8 and it's simply because we understand that because you're not traveling to the church your life is a little bit different. Uh, for those of you working moms and dads and you've got children at home and you're now transitioned to homeschool or uh, certainly the sunshine is still out and if you're like me you, you try to keep your kids in the yard as much as possible uh, and so we understand that it just um, kind of is a little bit easier uh, to finish our day together around God's Word. And so we will do it at 8 o'clock Friday night. Uh, Michael will be joining me. Uh, we'll have a little bit of music. We'll have some time in God's Word. And we'll even have communion uh, together. And so uh, for those of you that are in the Elkdale family and you're here in the Selma area, you can come by the church tomorrow between 8 to 5 if you haven't already. Uh, and pick up some elements for the Lord's Supper, or you can uh, certainly uh, get your own there uh, at the house, your bread and juice ready, and, and be ready to participate uh, in that. And then for Easter, again, we'll meet online, uh, and you can go to our website, uh, elkdale.org. Elkdale.org is our website, and in fact, uh, over this last week, we've kind of rehauled the website so that all of our resources are in one place right there on the main page, uh, because we are now living in this digital church age, uh, or at least for the season, our church is all uh, virtual. Uh, and so um, and so you can find everything at Elkdale.org. You can find Sunday school lessons, past sermons, past Wednesday night devotions, uh, material. Everything is right there. If you need us to pray for you, if you need help during this time, uh, then there's a place on there for you to fill that out, and it'll get sent to, to me. Um, so, because we want to be the body of Christ with one another, even though we can't be uh, together tonight, what I wanted to do is one of the things that I've been uh, kind of doing over the last few weeks in this uh, time of being separated, of being apart, is I've just been reading more and more and more uh, the passages of Scripture that that make me smile. Uh, and what I mean by that is there are passages all through the Bible where we just we just hear authors of Scripture describing the goodness of God, the love of God, the, the glory of God, the mighty, of, the mighty hand of God. And, and, when, we, and when we read those passages, it, it just tends to, 
to lift our eyes. It tends to give us uh, steadiness to our wobbly knees. And so um, what, what I would like for you to do is turn with me to Romans 11. Romans 11. We're going to look at the last few verses of Romans 11 uh, where Paul has been describing uh, the Lord. He's been describing the Lord and he kind of busts out into song uh, over the goodness of God. And it's just good for us uh, to hear uh, again how good God is, especially in this day and age where, where our lives are uh, different. Um, and so that's where we'll be. Romans chapter 11, verse uh, 33 through 36. Let me pray for us uh, and then we'll dive in. Father, I uh, thank you for those who have joined us uh, online tonight to study your word, uh, to rally around your scripture. I'm thankful, Lord, that we know that the church uh, is not a building. It's not an address. It is the body of Christ. It is those who you've called out, who have responded by faith and have been saved. Uh, they are the saints of God that have been covered by the blood of Christ. And so, Lord, even now as we are uh, operating church uh, collectively in a different way, we're reminded that the church uh, is the people of God and you are the head of the church. And we know, Lord Jesus, that you are not changed and you are not threatened by a virus and you will not lose your seat on the throne. And so the church will never fail because you will never fail. So, Lord, I pray tonight as we gather as the church in our own homes, in the uh, cab of our truck, in the break room at work, uh, in front of our devices, that as we open your word, Lord, we would just we would see again how good and mighty and wonderful you are. Uh, and, Father, I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I told you one of the things that I've been doing uh, is reading about just the, the parts of Scripture that remind me of who God is and, and remind me of His sovereignty, remind me of His goodness, remind me that He's in control, remind me that He's watching over us. These are the passages of Scripture that my heart's been drawn to recently during this kind of time of, of, of chaos. And Romans 11, the end of Romans 11, is one of those places where Paul, the preacher Paul, and the apostle Paul, and the writer Paul, uh, turns into the, the song leader Paul. And he begins to just kind of burst into song as his pen writes, uh, led by the Holy Spirit of the goodness of God. And so what I want you to see is just how he explains God. Let me read it to you. Romans chapter 11, verse 33 through 36. The very end of the chapter. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For in him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You can just kind of see Paul is, is dripping with worship. He's, he's overflowing. He's about to bust into song, if you will, as he writes this. And, and what you got to understand is the context here is Romans 1 all the way through Romans 11. Paul has been specifically writing from a, a theology and doctrine point of view. He's been arguing the gospel, the good news. He's been explaining the sinfulness of man. He's been explaining how Christ has rescued us, uh, how we are without hope unless we have Christ. He gives us some of the most beautiful verses in all the Bible about uh, how while we were still sinners, yet Christ died for us. Romans 8, 1, therefore now there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Jesus, he tells us that in Romans 10, that, that if we confess and believe, we can be saved. I mean, just this, this beautiful understanding of what God has done for us. And, and chapter 11 and chapter 12 is kind of the transition where in chapter 11, he moves from doctrine into practical life. If you look at your Bible in chapter 12, it starts by saying, therefore, brother, or I appeal to you. And you can tell that he's going to start getting into application. Because of what God has done for us, here's what you should do. So he's, he's finishing in chapter 11 this just beautiful chapter by chapter, verse by verse, description of the goodness of God found in Christ. And so chapter 11 is kind of the, the final burst of song when he's been just pouring over the goodness of God. And, and in these couple of verses we learn some things. First, I want you to see a couple of things we learn about God himself. I want you to see uh, what we learn about God himself. First, 
uh, we learn that that God that God knows everything. We we kind of see the limitless God in this passage, and we learn first that that He knows everything. Now, I, I know that that is not really a an overwhelming truth. I mean, we we understand God knows everything that He's that He's all knowing that He understands everything. But just just look at how He describes it. Look at look at the verse. It says, "Oh, the depths." of the riches, verse 33, and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are your judgments and inscrutable your ways. Now, Paul, more so than almost any other person that walked the earth, was well acquainted with the Lord. Now, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Jesus has changed his life. Jesus used him to write two-thirds of the New Testament. I mean, he was a, a man who knew and walked with God, and yet... Even after he's walked through chapters 1 through 11 of this deep and heavy and thick theology of God, he gets all the way to the end of that. And in the very end of all of this doctrine talk, he gets to the end and he says, I still don't know you. I still hadn't figured you out. I still don't know everything about you. There's still places in you, God, that I have not, that I've not searched yet. And why? Because he says that God is knows everything. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. It is, as Paul would say here, kind of the analogy of, you know, when I go to the beach, uh, and, and hopefully we'll get to go again, uh, when I go to the beach and I, and I begin to walk out into the water, as long as I can stand up, I'm, I'm feeling okay. And you, especially here in the Gulf in the South, the sand can go for quite some ways. And so you're walking and you're walking and you're walking and you're walking. And then there comes a moment where, where your feet aren't touching and the wave knocks you over and you realize how small you are in this big ocean. And, and you kind of find yourself realizing, oh, the depths of this water. Well, that's where Paul has found himself. He's been writing about God for 10 chapters, 11 chapters, and he gets to the end of all of this theological writing, and he says, I still can't touch the bottom. I still haven't made it out of the kiddie pool. I still haven't passed the shallow end. Oh, the depths and the knowledge, the richness of God, that he knows everything. I think about what we are learning from space we learn through telescopes about the stars and the planets and we see all of the galaxies and and we have just some beautiful knowledge and wisdom and i think about how even our our uh, most powerful telescope has limits and yet i read in psalm 19 1 the heaven declares the glory of god the skies above proclaim his handiwork, that, that we're learning about the stars and god is the one who placed the stars that his wisdom is limitless. Our text suggests here also when it says, Oh, the depths and the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God, our text, the way the words are here, it, it's it's the idea that God does not learn. Uh, now that's a that's a foreign concept. Over the last uh, few days and, and for the next few weeks, uh, most of us who have children that have been going to school are now home and, and we've transitioned into homeschool. And so I have three children and they're they're getting their assignments and we're logging in and we're printing things off and we're working and and I just got to be honest with you it's been a long time since I've done 6th grade math it's been a long time since I've done 4th grade english uh and so I'm I'm having to relearn how to do it in order to help them uh, uh, with their schooling now I, I praise the lord for the gift of google uh, but I'm learning how to do that again well, the text here, it, it, it tells us that God doesn't learn. There's nothing he needs to discover. He's not going to study anything. He's not going to read anything. There's, there's nothing he does not know. He knows everything, everything that has been, everything that will be, everything that could be. He is full when it comes to knowledge. His wisdom is beyond compare. But the text goes a little bit further. It says not only is his wisdom beyond compare, but his plans are beyond compare. Or, or, or they're not able to be comprehended. Look with me at the text, the second part of verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches and the wisdom of knowledge. There it is, the depths of his knowledge, that it's just, it's, it's overwhelming. And then look what he says. How unsearchable are your judgments and how unscrutable 
your ways. He says, how unsearchable are your judgments? Which means beyond human understanding. How unsearchable are your ways? Not only does God make plans and he knows everything, but it, it, this text suggests that if God were to even tell us his plans, we wouldn't understand them. We wouldn't get it. We wouldn't even be able to comprehend all that he's doing and moving. I heard one author say it this way. He said, we might see two or three things down the road. God sees 10,000 upon 10,000 upon 10,000. His plans are are just so massive that, that we can't find the end of them, that that he knows them. Uh, that, that God is, it's not that he's not necessarily unwilling to always share them with us, though we, we should not try to pry out the things of God. We should live by faith, knowing he's watching over us. Uh, but, but there's this idea that God's plans are, are so big, we couldn't even understand them. Uh, I'm reminded of what John Wesley said. John Wesley said, uh, show me a worm that can fully understand a man, and I will show you a man that could fully understand God. And he's just making the comparison between small and great and comprehension. And, and Paul says his plans are beyond comprehension. Uh, but I like what the text does in this next part. Not only do we see that God's knowledge is, is all-knowing, that he knows everything, and that his plans are, are far above us and that he's working. And, and let's just stop there and be reminded that's a good thing. Because for us, every day it seems like we don't know what's coming. We don't understand what's going to happen, especially now with, with, with this virus and, and what we're doing. And yet, God's plans, he knows completely, and he's not changed. He already knows everything, so it's not like he's reacting. He doesn't have to take in new knowledge and change his plans. He, he knows what he's doing because he has all knowledge. Well, then he says here at the very end of it, he knows everything that will happen. Verse 33, Oh, the depths and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are your judgments, how unscrutable your ways. He alone knows why everything happens. It says, inscrutable his ways. That means uh, we don't get to question his ways, that uh, only God knows what will happen, uh, and, and we don't necessarily know those judgments uh, but we bow before him knowing that, that his ways are right. We don't get to, we don't get to give God advice is what he's, what he's getting at here. And so just, just think for a moment what Paul's doing. He's been writing chapter by chapter by chapter about the depth of our sin, the grace of Jesus, the grace of God to give us Christ, the freedom there is in salvation, the freedom there is in the free gift of salvation, this goodness of God in salvation. And then he gets to the, all of this, and he's been, he's been going through it, weaving this doctrine in chapters 1, uh, 2, and 3, and 4, all the way up to chapter 11. And he gets to the end of it, and he says, I've studied this, I've written about it, I've communicated it to you, and I'm still realizing that I've barely scratched the surface. How knowledgeable you are. How big your plans are. How your ways are so much bigger than mine that that I, I have no standing to judge you, God, to, to bring judgment upon you. I have no standing to argue with you. You and you alone know everything. And brothers and sisters, why this has been good for my heart is, is because if God were diabolically evil, then for him to know everything and have all the plans in his hands would, would cause me to be without hope and in fear. But the glorious truth of God is he is loving and kind and wants to do good to those that he's created. And so he knows everything. He has these plans. His wisdom is unmatched. And you pair that with the fact that he's good, that he loves us. So now I can sit back and say, God, I'm not sure about tomorrow. I don't know what next week will look like. I, I'm scrambling to figure out what the next month is going to look like. God, I, I don't know, but I know you know. And I know that nothing that's happening is out of your wisdom or your knowledge. I know you're not knee-jerk and reacting. And I know, God, you love me. I know, God, you care for me. And so I know whatever plays out is good. It's going to be for my good and your glory because you are for your people. 
And so it's good that God knows everything and has the plans and that I don't because I, I can't comprehend all that. Now, the text tells us these wonderful things about God, but it also tells us some very uh, painful truths about us. We've learned that it tells us about God's knowledge and his plans and, and his wisdom and his, and his judgments are right. But, but notice what the text points to about us as, as people, us as, as humans. It tells us that we are limited. If God is limitless, we are certainly limited. And let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 34 and 35. For who knows the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsel or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. Now he, in this, he's given us three rhetorical questions. He's posing questions. He doesn't expect an answer because the answer is no, or we can't, or nobody is, is the answer to the questions. No one would be the answer to all of these questions when he says who has, who has, who has, and, and the answer is no one. But, but notice, the first thing we find here is that man is limited, that we cannot explain God. L look at verse 34. For who knows the mind of the Lord? Now, lots of people think they know what God is like, but the only thing we know about God are the things that he chooses to reveal to us. Um, I, I, I'm reminded of the story of the six blind men who find the elephant. And the first one walks into the side of the elephant and says, we've hit a wall. And the next one grabs a hold of a back leg and says, no, it's a, it's a tree. And the, the one in the front finds the big ear that is folded out and he says, no, it's a it's, it's a fan that's going to blow on us. And the, and the last one grabs the small tail and says, no, it's a, it's a rope that we're to climb. And, and you ask yourself, well, which one of the blind men is right? And they're all right. But then you ask, who's wrong? And, and they're all wrong. And the idea is, is that we only see a piece. We only see a part. We only see what is revealed to us. We would not know God if he did not reveal himself to us. And he reveals himself to us through his word, through the testimony of the spirit given in his word. He reveals himself climactically and ultimately in Christ, God in the flesh, our Savior and Lord. But even then, we only know what he has shown us. And in fact, Paul would tell us, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what beholds us, only what he's given us, only what he's showing us. And so we understand, for who has known the mind of the Lord? God, I only know you because you in your loving kindness have showed yourself to me. And the parts I know about you are wonderful and marvelous. And so therefore, even though I don't understand all of you and I don't know all of you, what I have seen, what I have tasted, what I have heard, what I have felt, what I have read, it is enough, Lord, to know you are good and you are in charge. And that's what I will put my hope and my faith in. But yet we know we cannot explain God. The second uh, limit here for man is we can't counsel God. Look, look at the second rhetorical question. Or who has been his counselor? Now we might give this a modern phrase and simply say, who gives God advice? Who, who can tell God anything? Who, who can give him uh, the opinion? Is there anyone smart enough to tell him what to do? Is there anyone that God will call? Uh, is there anyone that God will ask for advice from? Is there anyone that God will need? And, the idea here is no, we, we will not. It's, it's like trying to hold a flashlight up to the sunshine. Our light, our knowledge is, is washed out in this goodness of God. I'm reminded of a college student who was getting ready for Christmas break and he had not been studying for his final very well and he sat down for his final in his class and he began to answer some of the questions and he realizes he didn't know any of them. And so he wrote at the bottom of the page, uh, have mercy on me. Only God knows these answers. Merry Christmas. He was surprised when he got his test back and it said, uh, Merry Christmas to you. God gets a hundred. You get a zero. Uh, the idea here is that God does know everything. God is all knowledgeable, but we don't know and we can't give him advice. We can't. I think about the idea of imagine some of the prayers that you have prayed that the plans went totally different than what you were praying. Imagine the prayers that you were praying where the plans just completely went a different direction than what you thought you needed or wanted. And then we reflect over those and we realize, man, it's good that I didn't get it the way I thought I needed it or I wanted it because God doesn't need my advice. God doesn't need my counsel. I can't counsel 
him. I am limited. And then that leads to the last rhetorical question. Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? And we could read that simply as who can judge God? Who can hold court over God? Uh, the question comes from Job 41.11 where Job asks, who has claim against me? Excuse me, where God asks Job, who has claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. No one can ever say God owes me something or because the Lord will do uh, this, I've earned this. And, and, and we need to stop here for a moment because there are many, uh, particularly in the, uh, in, the, in the Western culture today, that, that somehow f believe that if they do a certain thing or they say a certain thing or they pray a certain way, that their, their words make God do something. Uh, that you know we 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 are demanding we're declaring we're we're uh you know uh saying we're speaking this and it will come true and and brothers and sisters there's nothing more dangerous than for us to think somehow that we can make god do anything god doesn't answer to us god doesn't do what we call him to do the glorious truth is is that god is all knowing he's all wise he's all powerful he sits over us and the beautiful truth is is that he loves us and he always does what is best for his children. And so I don't need to give God my advice on how to help me. I need to submit to what God is doing, knowing wherever he is leading me is going to be best for me. It's going to be right for me because I have nothing over him. And that leads finally to this idea, and, and this is where I wanted to take us, is we see in this doxology of Paul, this prayer of Paul, this worship song of Paul, of, of just how big God is and how limited we are. But this causes us to worship. This should move us into a heart of worship. More than ever, I think even now as we're spread out and we're home and, and we're not able to congregate together and we find ourselves uh, having cabin fever and getting isolated, more than ever is a time where we should sing to the Lord. We should praise the Lord. We should worship the Lord. We should lift our eyes above who we are and how good and marvelous he is. And so I want you to see just finally how Paul says, here's why we worship. Uh, he, he, here's why we sing. No, notice with me verse 36. For in him uh, and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And so we have here, first of all, that he's the source of all things. For in him, he's the source of all things, which means everything flows from Christ. All, all good and perfect gifts come down from the Father of lights. Everything is from Christ. And then he says, uh, not by, for him and through him, which means he's the sustainer of all things. He holds all things together. He knows the plan and will finish the plan of the Father in heaven. And then it says, uh, and to him are all things. He is the supreme purpose of all things. Christ is the supreme purpose of all things. This breathtaking statement of Paul is simply this. There is nothing left out, no part of creation that is excluded, that all of it is held together by Christ, that all of it is through Christ, and all of it is to bring glory to Christ. And Christ is calling us and inviting us into his family because he loves us. This is where worship comes. And so what we find here is that all of the theology we can have about God, we can study how big he is and how marvelous, and we can use big words, and we can talk about who we are. But what Paul shows us here is that all of that theology must at some point transition from doctrine to worship, from knowledge to lifestyle. That it's one thing to know about the goodness of God. It's another thing to live and walk and worship for the goodness of God. And so he's giving us this beautiful, just beautiful doxology of this is who God is. And this is how we are to worship, that God is limitless and he is worthy of all things. To him be the glory. I like how he finishes. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The mysteries of God must lead us in one of two directions. We, we will either stare at a God that is, that is so big and we will, we will act as if he doesn't exist and think that we are God in ourselves and make our own decisions 
or we will stare at a God that is so big but has chosen to love us through Christ and chosen to reveal himself to us, and we will say, God, I will never fully know you in this world. I will never fully understand all your plans. I will never fully know why you did this or that or this, but I will know that you love me and that you care about me and that you're over all things, and I will worship you. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. In life and death, to him be the glory. In joy and sorrow, to him be the glory. In good days and dark nights, to him be the glory. In sickness and in health, to him be the glory. In prosperity and poverty, to him be the glory. In days of peace and times of war, to him be the glory. In moments of victory and in dark defeat, to him be the glory. In answered prayers and prayers unanswered, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God is worthy of all our Worship. Now, why would I spend 20 minutes on a Wednesday night of Holy Week walking us through this doxology? Because, brothers and sisters, the world at this moment may feel like chaos, but Christ has come and conquered the world and died on the cross and rose from the grave and declared victory over all things. And it's that very God whom Christ leads us to, the God over all things. And so we declare to him, to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so even now, as I am teaching you from my office alone, not how I'd want to, to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May we find ourselves in these days of uncertainty, worshiping the Father, for He is all-knowing, all-powerful, above all things. And, and I am so fragile and so frail and so limited. And yet that very God invites me to a relationship with Him through Christ. And so in all things, I declare to God be the glory Amen. I don't know what all will happen through this uh, epidemic, pandemic that's going on in our country and around the world. I'm not sure all the different ways that God is using this. I, I can see some and there's some others that will come from it, but I know this. I know God is not surprised by it. He's not thrown off by it and that everything he does will ultimately bring him glory. So he will take weeping and mourning and turn it into laughter. He takes death and turn it into resurrection. He takes sickness and turns it into health. This is what our God does. And so we praise him and we trust him. Now, let me close by praying for us and praying uh, to the Lord who is over all things and who is good. And, and let me just remind you that we continue to pray uh, for you as a church, uh, to my Oakdale family. We continue to pray for our leaders in our country and for this, our medical people who are on the front lines. And, and um, we pray that the Lord would bring an end to this. But we know it's in his timing and his plan and he has a purpose and nothing is wasted. And I don't get to question his ways. I get to trust him because I know he loves me and you. Remember, if you have a need during this time, let me just encourage you. Go to the Lord in prayer. Go to his word and be reminded that he loves you and that he cares for you. And then certainly the church wants to be there. Go to elkdale.org. Click on that thing that says help. If you, if you want to call me or text me or email me, we are the church together. And if you find yourself in need, then, then please don't hesitate for us to rally to one another during this time. I look forward to Friday night where we'll have the Lord's Supper together in a time of worship and Michael will be joining me and it's going to be a good time. And so make sure you have your elements uh, tomorrow here at the church. We're open from eight to five. If you haven't come through, if you need us to deliver them to you, please let us know. Um, and we're looking forward to a good Friday uh, celebration of what the Lord has done for us. So let's pray together. Father. I thank you that tonight we can open your word and be reminded through the Apostle Paul that you are limitless, that nothing contains you or controls you, that you are the God who knows all things, that you are all wise. Your plans are perfect. You don't learn, Father. You don't change. You don't have to adapt. Nothing throws you off, uh, that you are the God who is above all things. And I thank you, Lord, that in our frailty, in our frailty, because God, we don't know everything about you. We don't know all your plans. We can't stand in judgment over you. God, we are so small compared to you. 
Lord, even over just the last few weeks, we just a just a virus, a flu uh, symptoms, Lord, have, have turned our fragile uh, life upside down. And so it just reminds us that we're nowhere near you. But yet, Lord, as we as we see this text tonight, you, the God over all things, you love us and you're for us and your plans are for our good and your glory and you're drawing us to you. And Lord, we thank you that that you don't take advice from us because we are we are flawed and, and broken. We thank you that you love us and that you, you work for our good even when we don't know what that looks like. And Lord, I just praise you. I praise you for who you are. And I pray again, Lord, that right now you would give strength and wisdom to our leaders, to our president, to our government, to our medical officials, to our state and local leaders, Lord. You would just give them great wisdom on how to lead uh, uh, through society, through uh, Father, the civil service side of our country, Lord, I pray for um, our medical professionals, our first responders, those uh, that are on the front lines of, of dealing with this, Lord. Give them strength, build them up, protect them. Thank you for their, their service. It's a picture of, of the goodness that is in humanity, the reflection that you have for us. And Lord, I pray for the church. Uh, not just Elkdale, but the church in a whole, Lord. I pray you'd strengthen it and, and great revival would break out for this. I pray, Father, even now for the one who's listening. And Lord, this virus, this economic downfall, this sickness, Lord, has made them realize just how frail they are and how quickly life can come to a halt and, and how fleeting it is, Lord. I pray that they would turn to you and know that they can have joy and, and safety for all eternity found in Christ. Lord, I pray for our church. I pray for the body that is Elkdale, Lord. I pray for those that are uh, feeling alone, feeling stressed. I pray for the mom and dad who's trying to figure out homeschool and work. Uh, I pray for the, uh, the senior adult who's uh, timid about traveling outside their home and, and they feel uh, maybe isolated or alone. For those that have uh, experienced even horrific things like uh, funerals with no people and hospitals where you can't visit and just the, the touch of this, Lord, I just pray you'd give sweet comfort uh, to all who are dealing with these uh, odd times. And remind us, Father, that when we look throughout history, there have been times where, where believers were burned at the stake and, and apostles crucified and stoned for preaching the gospel. And so, Lord, help us not to, uh, to take for granted that, that even while we are uh, feeling the weight of this trial, it is nothing like brothers and sisters uh, have felt before and who feel... Uh, even now around the world that are being persecuted. And so remind us to think of those who are isolated from the church all the time because of their stand for you. Lord, we pray you give them strength. And Father, we just ask that during this Easter week, you would move in a special and mighty way. And Father, you would use technology to advance your kingdom and that your name would be worshiped. And Father, for uh, from him and through him and to him are all things. And to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that is our prayer in Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you have a great night. God bless you and see you this weekend on Easter.